Mm -hmm. um, oh, great. It's the yeah, first time it works exactly. out. <laughs> great. Um, wait a minute, though. I need to. There we go. Okay. Um, so I, I want to thank you all for coming to this talk. And particular thanks to Effie for inviting me to participate in the seminar and for organizing everything so beautifully. Of course, I wish I was in Athens, which among other reasons is undoubtedly the most fitting place for talking about Ajax and about Sophocles. But I'm very honored to be part of the seminar in any format. I'm really sorry that my teaching schedule has prevented me from attending earlier meetings except that last week I was finally able to hear Francis Titchener's fascinating talk on Plutarch. And this really reinforced for me the difference between self-praise as a complicated move in real life social situations, such as those that Plutarch is concerned with, and the Homeric boast, a stylized, and to the extent that it is uttered in the midst of combat, highly improbable speech genre, conditioned by the traditional medium of oral poetry in which it is embedded and to which it is closely allied. My talk today will focus on echoes of the Homeric boast in the most Homeric surviving example of classical Athenian tragedy, Sophocles Ajax. Since as Effie mentioned, I'm working on a commentary on Ajax, I found in the invitation to participate in this seminar on self praise and self blame an irresistible opportunity to zero in on a specific passage about which there is some scholarly debate. A striking but somewhat perplexing boast voiced by Ajax, which also provides an opportunity to think somewhat more broadly about the complicated rhetoric of the Homeric boast. Ajax's boast comes at a marked and pivotal moment in the play's presentation of its hero. In the prologue, Ajax has appeared in a kind of mini drama staged for Odysseus by Athena in a state of furious derangement, bent on killing and torturing the animals that he believes are the Achaean leaders. Now he has returned to the stage after recovering his senses and surrounded by the carcasses of the slaughtered animals, he experiences the full awfulness of his situation in which he has failed in his attempt to punish the leaders for depriving him of Achilles armor. And it is of course, Ajax's failure to be awarded that armor that drives the plot of this play. And at the same time, his murderous intentions have been exposed. In an extended lyric commas, Ajax sings about his extreme humiliation and his determination to die in dialogue with his mate Tecmessa and the chorus of loyal Salaminian sailors who respond in iambics. This is the moment of most heightened emotional expression for him. Everything he utters afterwards is spoken rather than sung. In the final antistrophe of the Comos, he addresses the Trojan landscape, which he claims has held him too long. There we go. O oh, nearby streams of the Scamander, well disposed to the Argives, you will no longer see this man. I will pronounce a great boast, whose like Troy never saw in the army that came from Greece. But now I lie like this, deprived of honor. So what should we make of the fact that Ajax's lyric outpouring culminates in a boast? and in a boast that is explicitly announced as that through Ajax's aside, I will pronounce a great boast and one that makes a very large claim to have been the uniquely greatest of the entire Achaean army. Scholars commenting on this passage disagree about how to take it, falling into two camps which, which map onto broader debates about how to understand Sophoclean heroes. Some, including notably Winnington Ingram and Finglass, interpret it primarily as a sign of Ajax's flawed character, which is marked by excessive pride or megalomania. Finglass characterizes Ajax's words as an expression of what he calls defiant monomania. 
This makes them pietists in the division of opinion that Winnington Ingram himself described and to which he gave this terminology. So-called pietists stress the transgressive arrogance and self-assertion of Sophoclean heroes, which they see as justifying their defeat at the hands of offended gods. For other critics, however, Ajax is not at this point displaying excessive arrogance. He's just being Homeric. And with this interpretation, they engage in the downplaying of Ajax's arrogance and impiety that Winnington Ingram opposes and calls hero worshiping. So Malcolm Heath writes that these lines should be compared with the boasting of epic heroes. And Alex Garvey comments that such boasting is normal for an epic hero. So nothing excessive or psychopathic here. Jeb also characterizes the boast as epic in tone and cites two parallels. One is Odysseus as he identifies himself at the beginning of his long apologia in Odyssey 9. The other is Achilles in Iliad 18, who refers to himself as toios hoios utis achaion, of such a kind as no other of the bronze wearing Achaeans. This Iliad parallel is regularly brought up by other commentators as well, beginning with Eustathius, who believed that Ajax's words were in fact modeled on this passage in Homer, as was to be expected from Sophocles. This enabled the Homer-loving Sophocles to make Ajax say about himself that he was such a kind as Troy had seen no one like in the army that came from Hellas. And notice that Eustathius in the paraphrase that leads up to his summary, his quotation, has added a toyuton that makes Ajax's boast resemble Achilles toyos hoyos even more closely. Especially given how close this parallel is, it does seem, seem worthwhile to follow up on these suggestions that Ajax's words need to be considered in relation to the boasting of Homeric heroes, especially since the play does demonstrably have the Iliad in view. But that comparison also has to be undertaken with awareness that a parallel does not necessarily mean an equivalence and that Sophocles uses Homeric references in Ajax as much to draw distinctions as to establish continuities, something that Pat Easterling demonstrates very clearly in her important analysis of Sophocles reworking in Ajax of the scene between Hector and Andromache in Iliad three. Clearly reminiscent as they are of Homeric boasting, Ajax's words are also significantly different in a number of important ways. One is the relationship they bear to poetic tradition. The heroes of the Iliad operate in a context in which their place in that tradition is still in formation. And when they boast, they are attempting to launch and solidify their future reputations. When a hero praises himself after having done something on the battlefield, it is as if he is converting his own action into an immediate and authoritative spoken record, a first draft of the tradition he hopes will be perpetuated forever after. When boasts come before a battlefield encounter, they are projections, forecasts that the hero speaking them hopes will be converted by the narrative into established fact. They represent attempts, sometimes successful, sometimes unsuccessful, to preempt a tradition that is still developing. Either way, these heroes are trying to shape from within the poem the process that the poem itself is engaged in of creating and maintaining klaus. That is why the right to boast is presented as, as itself the prize that they are fighting of, over, as in Sarpedon's famous words when he calls to Glaucon to go into battle by saying, let us go and give someone a boast or let someone give it to us. And as Leonard Mulner showed in his study of Elchomai and its cognates, cognates, the term Elchos is closely related in its position and phraseology to terms for more established forms of praise, such as kudos and the highest prize of all, klaos the form of praise that is congruent with the poetic tradition. 
Sophocles' version of Ajax, on the other hand, may be speaking at the same point in mythological history, but in literary historical terms, he comes much later and his words sharply contradict a long-standing tradition about his stature that was already alluded to in the Iliad, but that had only become more firmly established in the intervening period to the point where it was a recognized truism and a signature feature of his identity. Rather than being someone who had no like in the Achaean army, as he tries to claim, Ajax was known for being the next best in that company after Achilles. This is stated in the Iliad in relation to the Iliad's own central theme of Achilles' withdrawal in a kind of summary of the catalog of ships in book two um, of men, that is men in the Achaean army, by far the best was Telamon, was Ajax's, Ajax son of Telamon as long as Achilles was raging. By the time of Sophocles and his audience, Ajax's next best status had been reiterated in many other poetic and artistic media. We have allusions to it in surviving poems of Alcaeus and Pindar, and it featured in several scolia or popular drinking songs, as in this example, um, in which it is explicitly stated that this was Ajax's reputation, legacy, they say that you were the best of the Danaeans who came to Troy after Achilles. And note also the same way of designating the Greek army as those who came to Troy. The relative statures of the two heroes is literally depicted in the famous vase painting by Exekius of the two of them playing a board game where Achilles is taller in part by virtue of the helmet he is wearing. This is just one of several depictions of this scene and may possibly allude to an otherwise lost epic tradition that it was through a roll of the dice that this ranking was conclusively established. In light of this firmly established tradition, Ajax's counterclaim in Sophocles' play has to have seemed jarringly inauthentic to the original audience as the claims of Homeric heroes would not be even ones that prove in the event to be equally unfounded. So for example, before fighting Sarpedon, Tlepolemus gives a longish boast in which he celebrates the achievements of his father Heracles in the first Trojan War, and then predicts that Sarpedon will not be a source of protection for the Trojans. I don't think you will be a savior for the Trojans, even though you are very strong but you will pass through the gates of Hades, defeated by me. Only a few lines later, he is proven wrong when Sarpedon kills him, but that doesn't really negate the validity of his boast with its combination of a reference to an authentic tradition about Heracles and projection of a desired, still to be decided future outcome. So Ajax's boast seems in a very different way to fly in the face of established fact. To return to my earlier point, the conclusive establishment of rankings among heroes is always in prospect in the Iliad and also always elusive and repeatedly deferred. As Gregory Nage quickly points out in his groundbreaking study of this phenomenon, the best of the Achaeans, the title best of the Achaeans, which is a major theme of the Iliad is hotly contested. There is a cadre of heroes who are motivated by the hope of earning that title. And because it is the object of such intense competition, they are very careful not to make the provocative move of applying it to themselves or to applying to themselves the specific locution, Aristos Achaion, or any other expression suggesting that, such as Ajax's claim that no one else in the army is like him, except for Achilles in that one passage in book 18. In other words, the passage that is regularly cited to show that what Ajax says is normal for a Homeric hero is actually quite exceptional. And I will eventually be coming back to that passage. Moments when the title might seem to be decided are deflected. One reason for this is indicated by Odysseus as he plays his own traditional Iliadic role of keeping order in the Achaean camp, lying low until the right time for him to shine, 
which is destined to come well beyond the confines of the Iliad's plot. This is during the night raid in book 10, when Diomedes has been charged by Agamemnon with selecting as a companion the Aristos, the best of the group of volunteers who are all the leading Achaeans except Achilles. Diomedes picks Odysseus, citing his cleverness and his special support from Athena, and Odysseus accepts the call, but refuses the title, acknowledging that it might not be acceptable to the others. Son of Tydeus, don't praise me so much or blame me. You are speaking to Argives who know about these things, but let us go. Both the harmonious functioning of the Achaean army and the ongoing movement of the Iliad's plot depend on the withholding of a conclusive designation of anyone as the unrivaled best. Even though, as Odysseus suggests, the Argives do have their views of this, as does, in fact, the poet. In constructing the narrative, the poet also necessarily curtails moments of premature decision, as in the duel between Hector and Ajax in Book 7. This is an occasion that might test the question of whether Ajax's resemblance to Achilles is sufficiently great that he could defeat Hector, but that is in fact left unresolved. The way the duel is going, it looks as if maybe he could, then it ends with the arrival of nightfall before that can be decided. The question of who really can defeat Hector and whether stopping Hector will depend on Achilles' return is left open so that it can generate further developments in the plot. As Hector indicates, Ajax has been shown on this occasion to be the best of the Achaeans, at least with the spear, but the contest between them remains undecided. Ajax, since a god gave you stature, strength, and intelligence, you are the most powerful of the Achaeans with a spear. But we should let, let, uh, let I'm sorry, we should um, leave aside fighting and hostility for today. Later, we will fight again until a god decides between us and gives one of us victory. Not only do, um, sorry, not only do heroes have to be careful about the reception by human auditors of their boasts, as Odysseus suggests, um, or even of um, extreme claims about them made by others, they also have to be mindful of the ever-present divine audience. The gods are at once the knowledgeable listeners who can authenticate a hero's claims and thereby turn those claims from hypotheses into authoritative traditions and the source of those powers on which the hero's claims are based, for which those gods demand adequate recognition. So in authoring these high stakes self descriptions, heroes have to successfully combine the overlapping factors of divine sponsorship and personal merit. Thus relying again on Mulner's study, Elkomai and Elkos, the Homeric terms of art for boasting and boasts, simultaneously designate praying, vowing, and what we call boasting. So that a boast also implies an appeal to a God and a promise linking self-assertion to an acknowledgement of an ongoing relationship of patronage, dependence, and obligation. The, the gods must not go without credit although ideally they should not get all of it as they do in Hector's somewhat grudging concession to Ajax. So it's interesting to see Ajax himself managing this in a quite complicated boast of his own that happens in the run-up to the duel. When he sees that his has been the winning lot in the, in the lottery to determine who will face Hector, um, he announces, Oh, friends, the lot is mine, and I rejoice in my heart because I, I think I will defeat godlike Hector. But now, all of you, while I am putting on my battle armor, pray to Lord Zeus, the son of Kronos, silently to yourselves so the Trojans won't hear, or openly, since we need not fear anyone, and no one who wants to can beat me back if I don't let him, by force or by skill since I do not think I who was born and raised in Salamis am such a novice. So as Ajax makes an optimistic prediction, one of those that ultimately proves false, 
He also admits that Zeus's help must be solicited, but then he backtracks a little, giving just a little prominence, less prominence to his dependence on it. It would be all right, he suggests, for the Trojans to know that the Achaeans were praying to Zeus, which presumably might lead them to try to counter with a prayer of their own or some other extra effort, because he himself is so great. And he mentions his illustrious Salaminian origins as a sign of that. Returning to Sophocles, his version of Ajax differs significantly from the Ajax of the Iliad precisely because he has a history of boastful speech that flagrantly fails to meet this requirement that actually takes the form of aggressive refusal to acknowledge the need for divine help. This isn't dramatized within the play itself, but is narrated in a messenger speech reporting a conversation in the Achaean camp. There, the prophet Calchas has explained that Athena's intense anger at Ajax was caused by these boasts. And the fact that they are conveyed in a third person narrative allows for repeated explicit characterization of his words as transgressive and unconventional boasts. The first of these occurred when he was leaving Salamis for the war, when he was setting out from home and his father gave him good advice, he was found to be witless. His father told him, son, you should want to win with your spear, but always with a God's support. But he responded boastfully and thoughtlessly, father, with the gods, even a nobody could prevail, but I am quite sure that I will gain this glory without their help. So great was his boast. The second time was later during the actual fighting at Troy when Athena appeared at Ajax's side to encourage him. Then he answered with a terrible, unspeakable speech. Goddess, stand by the other Argives. Where I am, where I am stationed, the battle will never break in. With words like these, he earned the goddess's relentless anger for not thinking mortal thoughts. These events are clearly incompatible with the Iliad, where the version of Ajax who appears there simply would not behave that way. And in fact, he is never portrayed in the Iliad intersecting with Athena or with any other god. That in Ajax we see, and then later in this messenger speech hear about, a version of Ajax who is incompatible with earlier traditions is actually acknowledged by Athena herself at the end of the prologue. During the preceding scene, she has put Ajax on display for Odysseus in a deranged state that is caused by rage over the loss of Achilles' armor and delusions sent by Athena herself. There, he has demonstrated a great deal of arrogance and has explicitly claimed the right to boast. Um, when she asks him, did you dye your sword thoroughly in the Argive camp? He responds, I can boast of that. I will not deny it. At the end of this display, Athena herself comments on how this is a new and different version of Ajax. Odysseus, do you see how great the God's power is? Who, I ask you, could have been found who was more foresightful, pronousteros? And here she stresses that presence of mind that was so emphatically absent in Calchas's account of Ajax's boasting. Who could have been found who was more foresightful than this man or better at doing the right thing at the right time? This I would suggest is an indication on Sophocles part of how untraditional this version of Ajax is, as well as a reminder on Athena's part of what Ajax has willfully ignored how powerfully the gods affect mortal life. So to return now to Ajax's boast at the end of the Kamos, this untraditional backstory positions that flagrantly untraditional claim as part of a longer pattern of arrogant boasting. And that would seem to confirm the view of those critics who read the boast as one more sign of Ajax's arrogant personality. But before uh, ending with that conclusion, it also makes sense to compare Ajax's boast more closely to the one similar boast that is found in the Iliad, the one spoken by Achilles in book 18, that 
Eustathius believed it was modeled on. Now, since I am not going back to my much loved home, nor was I a light of salvation for Patroclus or my other comrades, so many of them killed by glorious Hector, but I sit by the ships, a useless burden on the land. I, who am of such a kind as no other of the bronze-wearing Achaeans in combat, though others are better in counsel. What is interesting here is not just the similarity of wording, but the similarity of the two heroes' situations. Both describe themselves as unrivaled, not to make a confident prediction of future success, but to highlight the degree of their present failure and humiliation. And both draw attention to their shameful inactivity. Achilles sits on the earth, am I, as a useless burden. Ajax lies where he is, pro am I, in a state of dishonor. The circumstances of the two are far from identical, but both are experiencing humiliation. Both are in an absolute low that is also a crucial turning point in their story. While both are currently in a state of stasis, each of them has decided on a course of action that means that he will die at Troy and never return home. Those courses of action are, of course, very different in ways that encapsulate the ultimate difference between the two of them. Ajax will go on, uh, sorry, Achilles will go on to fight and kill Hector, settling the question of who will be able to do that and proving himself to be definitively within the Iliad, the best of the Achaeans. And while this step is, as he himself admits, in effect suicidal, since it will assure his death at Troy, it is also a source of lasting glory. Ajax, on the other hand, will refuse to fight any more on the Achaean side and will die by his own hand without doing any great exploit on the battlefield. So Ajax's self-description in language derived from Achilles only points up the difference between the two heroes. But even if Ajax does not live up to his unsubstantiated claim to be unique in the way that Achilles is, he is at the beginning of a trajectory that leads to his regaining of his Iliadic identity as not Achilles equal or Achilles double, but as the next best after Achilles, which is confirmed in a number of ways. One is that his suicide is conceived of as the outcome of the duel with Hector that is left unconcluded in Iliad 7. Much is made by Ajax himself and by his half-brother Teucer of the fact that the sword with which Ajax kills himself was given to him by Hector at the end of that duel. And it now reappears as an instrument of ongoing enmity rather than a gift of friendship. So Ajax is in effect killed by Hector as Teucer points out. Did you see how in time Hector was destined to kill you even after he was dead? While some balance is maintained when Teucer goes on to observe that the belt Ajax gave Hector attached Hector's body to the carriage behind which Achilles dragged him, Ajax was not himself Hector's killer. And so it is now unmistakable that he could not do what Achilles could. But after he has died, Ajax's fallen fortunes begin to rise again. He goes through a process that is often labeled rehabilitation and is reintegrated into the Achaean community when Odysseus secures the burial of his body. And this, as I said, means that he is realigned with the Ajax of the Iliad. Odysseus's gesture is preceded by arguments on um, Ajax's behalf by Teucer that recall some of this his most impressive actions during the fight fighting at Troy as the community-minded fighter on behalf of the whole Greek army. And these are events that are compatible with the Iliad, unlike the boastful encounter with Athena reported by Calchas. They include warding off disaster when Hector set fire to the ships and stepping up to meet Hector in that single combat. These arguments do not persuade Agamemnon to whom they are addressed, but they are in effect validated when Odysseus intervenes and gets Agamemnon to agree to Ajax's burial. 
In doing so, Odysseus specifically reasserts mm. where reasserts uh, um, uh, Ajax's traditional identity as the next best after Achilles. Ajax may have been Odysseus's enemy, but he would not deny that he was the single best man of the Argives of all of us who came to Troy except Achilles. Odysseus is certainly paying tribute to Ajax with this designation, and his words can even be read as a concession that Ajax should have been the one to um, receive Achilles' armor, although he does not actually say that. But the fact that Odysseus was in fact awarded the armor and that he is alive while Ajax is dead, with other great achievements and claims to glory still to come, is also a reminder that being the next bat best after Achilles does not mean what Ajax evidently expected that it would, that he was essentially Achilles double, and that when Achilles was no longer present, he could step into Achilles' preeminent position. For a different understanding of what it might mean to be the next best after Achilles, we can return once again to book seven of the Iliad, and to another boast spoken there by Ajax himself. Holding this, and this is his great sevenfold shield, holding this in front of his chest, Ajax, son of Telamon, stood right by Hector and spoke threatening words. Hector, now you will clearly see one against one what the best men of the Achaeans are like those next after Achilles, the lion-hearted breaker of men. He lies by his high peak sea crossing ships, raging at Agamemnon, shepherd of the people. But we are such men as can stand up against you, and we are many. So now begin your fighting. Even when he has just been singled out as the outstanding Achaean, the one who is best suited to meet Hector one-on-one, -on -one, and therefore as the one who resembles Achilles most. Ajax also identifies himself as just one of a group of heroes, none of whom is, is as good as Achilles and none of whom could actually defeat Hector. Though of course he is not prepared to admit that at this moment. And this is the role that Ajax plays throughout the Iliad as the Hercos Achaion, the defender of the Achaeans, the leader of a group effort that keeps the threat posed by Hector at bay, but never overcomes it. And that entirely traditional version of Ajax is the version that emerges in the final sections of Sophocles' play and is honored when his body is allowed to receive proper burial. The idea that Ajax's burial means that he is being honored for his service to a community is further reinforced if one accepts, as I myself am inclined to do, that the play is alluding to Ajax's future status as a cult hero in Athens. If that is the case, then Ajax's transgressive actions and his transgressive speech in the form of a series of boasts are not just pre preludes to his eventual receipt of an honorific burial, but necessary conditions for it. They represent the headlong clash with a powerful divinity that precedes the hero's assumption of more than human powers after he has died and at the place where he is buried. And it may be that the particular connection between Ajax's boast and his burial as, part of, as both part of this dynamic of transgression followed by exceptional honor is hinted at within the boast itself. Commentators regularly note that the final word of the boast, pro kemi, is a term used of corpses laid out for burial as part of a proper funerary ritual. What Ajax describes as a state of useless paralysis brought on by dishonor, I lie here deprived of honor, is also a hint of what lies ahead as he becomes a corpse and then a corpse that will be properly buried and so no longer dishonored. So to conclude, the striking boast explicitly marked as a boast that Sophocles has Ajax sing at this pivotal moment in the play 
is an invitation to consider Sophocles' version of Ajax in relation to earlier traditions, and especially to the Iliad. The Iliad, with which the play is unquestionably in dialogue, is where we find heroic boasting as a frequent and constituent element of the narrative. And we also find one unusual boast spoken by Achilles that offers a prototype or model for this one. The comparison underscores significant differences. And despite its traditional form, Ajax's boast is revealed to be highly untraditional. For him to speak of himself as if he were Achilles is to contradict his essential identity as second best to Achilles. And in relation to the previous history he's given in the backstory of this play, it serves as the culmination of a series of boasts that aggressively break the rules of Homeric boasting by denying the power of the gods. And in these ways, it does, as some critics claim, contribute to a portrait of Ajax as offensively arrogant. But that is not the whole story. And we are only a third of the way through the play at this point. And those who stress the Homeric flavor of this boast, and especially its relationship to Achilles' boast in Book 18, also have a point. It is not really possible to capture Sophocles' multi-layered and shifting portrait of Ajax from either a strictly pietist or a strictly hero-worshipping position. And those are, of course, extremes that few critics actually adopt. One of the most challenging shifts Ajax undergoes is from being radically unlike his traditional Homeric self to being very much like him, both in his inability to be the one who defeats Hector and in the way he is remembered. By echoing Achilles in his boast, Ajax shows how little he understands his own position, but he also places himself in a Homeric context at a turning point in his evolution when he is returning to his senses and beginning to move back towards the identity he had in the Iliad. He cannot do what he is trying to do here, which is to step into Achilles' place, but he can regain his lost honor through his traditional identity as the next best after Achilles, an indispensable member of the community who serves that community by fighting in the hope of earning the status of best, which for him, will always stay out of reach. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Richard, for this yeah. very- I'm trying to come yeah. back. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am. Thank you very much for this uh, very insightful talk, convincing for me. Um, would Professor Roberts would like to kick the discussion? Professor Roberts. Uh, I have a really interesting paper. I'm not sure I have an immediate question, although I guess um, I, this is a little bit of field, but the conversations about where people do and don't call themselves or get called best of the Achaeans, this is a sidestep from Ajax, but since I'm being asked to start this off, um, does that moment in the in early in book one where uh, Achilles refers to Agamemnon as somebody who boasts that he is best of the Achaeans. And I, I wonder if there are other instances of that kind of sort of secondhand referring. You were talking about the fact that people tend, yeah. So that, that was just a thought. It, I, it is definitely a sidestep from your focus, which I found completely, your argument completely convincing. And so no questions about. Yeah, I mean, so so that moment in book one makes it clear, you know, from the get go. Sorry. Um, so that moment in book one makes it makes it clear from the get go just how very contested um, this identity is, and how, um, you know, if if Ajax is going around claiming it, how much uh, if Agamemnon is going around claiming it, how much um, you know uh, difficulty he's causing for himself. It, as I recall, it's not, there, there aren't other passages that are quite like that. There are yeah. places where people are willing to call each other, you know, refer to other people as the best, but either in a, um, 
in a specific area. So there's a point at which someone says that Tusser is the best at archery. Um, or there's a point where um, I think Calchas is said to be the best at prophecy. So people will make that kind of comment. And then people will also sometimes in Homer say that someone was the best after he died. Um, and as a way of kind of um, getting themselves kind of worked up to go um, engage in, in vengefulness. Um, but it's actually very, it's not at all typical for people to say that about themselves. Um, and and um, that's why it's so striking um, that Achilles does it at that one moment. Other questions? If you could just wave your hands or just you know, unmute and jump. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands for the time being. So can I ask you, Bridget, uh, I, I found your argument very convincing, by the way. Um, I would just uh, like to start uh, with uh, uh, a pragmatic question, first of all, uh, about the, in the Iliad, about Ajax not intersecting uh, in any form with any uh, god, right? Or divine. Yeah. Well. Is there some uh, other example on the Achaean side at least, uh, or is he the only one? Because I honestly cannot, uh, I don't know that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, and, and I, you know, I don't want to like make a pronouncement that someone will pull out their Iliad and contradict, <laughs> but I, I do think that that's actually um, a notable um, feature of Ajax's role in the, in the Iliad. Um, and, um, you know, it may go back to some um, of the really kind of early traditions about him being invulnerable that are um, really, really um, very far in the background in the in the Iliad, um, but maybe still making their mark. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank but certainly, I mean, you know, the other major Achaean heroes, you can think of times when they're engaging with God, Diomedes, um, you know, certainly Achilles, Odysseus, Agamemnon, and so forth. Um, yeah. At, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It, certainly anyone who's of his stature yeah. um, has some kind of quite significant encounter, I think, with a divinity in the, in the poem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Professor Bowie? <laughs> Hello, thank you very much, Bridget. Marvelous paper and takes me back to the very few occasions that I actually taught the Ajax. So you're, I'm intervening as somebody <laughs> with very little knowledge of the literature on this. But I wonder if there's anything significant in the choice of the word epos in your first passage, epos exer omega, which yeah. as far as I know is not part of the traditional vocabulary of boasting in itself in the Iliad, but I may have forgotten passages. It's associated with other self-declarations, but not a euchos. Um, yeah. And I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I wonder if, if it is as unusual as I think it is, <laughs> whether there is some hint here to ask his audience to compare epos with tragodia. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, the word that is more uh, often used for for um, boasting, I mean, aside from like the technical term eukos in in the Iliad, would be muthos. Um, and um, I absolutely, um, yeah, I think you're right um, that that could quite. I mean, it's I just um, you know I'm not it's one of those things you can never be completely certain about, but I think that it's actually very suggestive because it really does seem like this is a moment when um, we're being asked to think about um, Ajax in relation to, to Epos, absolutely. And I, I, I mean, I feel the same is really true of that thing that Athena says about, you know, <laughs> notice, this isn't the way he used to be. This isn't the way he would appear in the past. And I think she really means in the literary, I mean, in the literary historical past. Um, I, I don't think, you know, Sophocles is nowhere near as sort of overtly um, 
calling attention to what he's doing as Euripides is. But I think that there are hints um, absolutely in moments like that. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Falakas, please. Uh, thank you very, very much for this presentation. Uh, years ago, I did some work on Homer and Sophocles' Ajax, and I, I fully understand and agree with your interpretation in terms of this play being um, in favor of the honor of Ajax in Athens and Salamis, the, the cult of Ajax. Um, so may I just ask, um, towards the end, there is a discussion between Teusa um, and on the one hand Menelaus later, later on Agamemnon. And part of that discussion is, um, if I remember well, if I understand it well, who has the right to be proud of what um, now that Ajax is dead? And so Teusa defends the corpse of Ajax, claiming that, that he has been such a hero at Troy, whereas Menelaus says, uh, for instance, um, in 1087 to 88, that he, Ajax, was, has been Aithon Hubristes so far, um, a burning, um, arrogant figure. But now it's me, Menelaus says, um, who meg au prono. Um, I can, I don't know how to translate it, this, but it's, it's definitely a sort of megalomaniac statement. Um, and so Teusa tries to defend himself and the chorus and the corpse of Ajax, Agamemnon comes in and goes back to that problem, who is the best of the Achaeans? and asks Teusa why, although he is not a genuine son and possibly he's a slave, Teusa, then Agamemnon asks, um, why should we tolerate the, um, the defense of the corpse of Ajax by such useless people like the Salaminians and Teusa? And, um, where has Ajax been? What he has ever done in Troy that I, Agamemnon, could not do better, etc., uh, etc. Et so my question is, sorry if I, it took me long because I wanted to refer to these passages. The second one is 1234 to 36, um, of 1235 to 40, um, my, my question is, do we have to understand um, Ajax's boast from the beginning? Uh, and as you said, as a kind of foreshadowing of it when due to the word prokemai at the end of that um, passage. Do we have to understand it as opposed to the kind that Menelaus and Agamemnon talk about themselves later on? Um, trying to humiliate not just the corpse, but also the Salaminians. Thanks. Um, great, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I, I'm not, I mean, thank you for, um, you know, that excellent exposition. Um, I'm, um, and I, I mean, I think absolutely um, that whole passage of wrangling towards the end um, returns you to the sort of flavor of competition um, of um, in in the camp um, that all of these heroes have been operating in, um, and it really strikes me that um, you know some of the things that Men I mean Menelaus and Agamemnon are saying about. Um, about Ajax, I mean, it's actually sort of an interest, 
as you were speaking, I was thinking it's sort of interestingly parallel to the problems they have with Achilles, that particularly that Agamemnon has with Achilles in the Iliad. Um, so it's a very similar, um, it is the kind of replay of that problem of being the leader um, and sort of the, the politically most prominent and yet having these, you know, really, really powerful heroes who are kind of giving you a run for your money all the time. Um, so um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm quite in sympathy um, with what you're saying, um, that, this, that, that, whole, that whole sequence is very relevant to this um, world of, um, you know, jockeying for position um, that is what the Achaean camp is, is like. I wasn't sure whether you would accept that there is boasting by Menelaus and Agamemnon in the end, because I have not, I have not properly checked the phrasing. But thank you, yeah. thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's verbal sparring for sure, um, which you know, boasting is just a kind of sometimes I think a somewhat more formalized version of. Professor Titzner, please. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. I should make sure. Okay, that should do it. You can hear me now? Perfect. Oh, for heaven's sake. I figure once I get really good at this, we'll all be back to face to face. It won't matter. It will be a useless skill. I enjoyed your presentation so much. I was lucky enough to study Ajax at the University of Texas with Michael Gagarin. And right from the very beginning, when Achilles was uncomfortable, something I had never seen in my mental picture of Achilles, that he thought that he didn't like what Athena was saying, you know, it was too far. So my question for you, and I have to invoke an American phrase for my um, non-American colleagues, which is we talk about bragging rights. In other words, that this can be everything from a competition. Bragging rights often implies that, that the actual thing being contested is minor or insignificant, that what you are contending for is the right, the right to brag. I am the greatest. I did this, that, or the other. And I wonder if you'd, you'd comment whether you think that the idea of bragging in a justified or specific context like that uh, has any kind of difference, or if in fact it really is a cultural thing that doesn't travel. Um, so um, I guess my first thought um, is to um, go back to those passages, those many passages in the Iliad where when warriors are going into battle, they say that what's at stake is the Eokos. I mean, it really does almost seem as if they are saying, I mean, you know, Sarpedon could be saying, um, let's give, you know, let's t give someone the bragging rights or take the bragging rights ourselves. I mean, it seems as if um, that it, that's exactly what they quite knowingly are fighting over um, is the, and, and I think that that's, you know, not unrelated um, to, um, you know, the fundamental um, feature of their um, whole endeavor, which is they are putting themselves in a situation where they are very likely to lose their lives. And the only thing that is lasting that they are going to get out of this is this spoken tradition of verbal commemoration. Um, so that's why I say that in a way, what they're trying to do is get that started. Um, you know, um, and um, they usually don't get to experience it. And of course here, Odysseus, um, whom you were just mentioning is um, a really interesting um, exception because he actually gets to live on and hear himself sung about. Um, and it's interesting that the other boast that's brought up as supposedly comparable to Ajax's is the one that, that um, Odysseus sort of begins his apologia with where he gives his name and his lineage. And then his says, he says, my Kleos goes up to Oranos. I mean, so he is the one who has actually um, experienced and can point to the fact that he has become part of a 
of a tradition. I think the closest that a hero who ends up dying can come is the thought that he did get those bragging rights um, and that what he says about himself might then be repeated in song. I appreciate your very gentle correction to Odysseus from Achilles. Yeah, yeah. It's all these vowel names, don't yeah. you know? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Great. Uh, other questions, please? Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, yes, Professor Hugh, please. Kenneth Hugh. Hello. Hi, 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 Bridget. I don't know if you remember me. We, we saw each other in London a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It's great to see you. Um, thank you for the talk. I found it really striking um, how both boasts that you compare, the boast of Ajax and the, the boast of Achilles in Book 18, occur in moments of intimacy and solitude. Um, and I was just wondering, um, whether you could say something about who is in the presence of these boasters in these really idiosyncratic moments. I find it really striking that, you know, it's not before a, a grand public, it's not in a very ceremonious venue, it's Achilles who's talking to his mother and Ajax who's speaking to a, a non-human entity. He's speaking to the, the, ravine, the, the rivers that are, that are connected to the Scamander. So I'm wondering um, if there's something to be said about the fact that the recipient of Ajax's boast is not even a, a divine, I mean, you could consider the, the aquatic, you know, features to be divine in a certain sense, but they're not Thetis and they're not humans. So what kind of a boast is a boast that doesn't have a, a kind of agent recipient? It's, he's speaking to himself. It's, it's really striking. Yes, thank you. That is really, really a wonderful point. Um, and it really gets to the, I mean, oddly enough, in a way, these aren't, I mean, these are these two speech speeches, which one of which Ajax, you know, labels a boast, aren't really boasts at all in the usual sense. And I guess, I mean, that you've just given a sort of no other reason for this point, um, which I've been sort of gradually arriving at, because, um, they aren't, as you say, they are, they're not, they're not spoken in a public arena where they're trying to make that kind of, I mean, the, make the impact that we've been talking about that Homeric boasting usually does. Um, and um, they're really, as they're also, you know, as, I mean, I think that goes with the fact that they are actually assessments of failure rather than claims to success, either future or past. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think that that's really, really crucial. Thank you. Thank you. And I actually have to run, but it's th thank you again for your talk and it was great to see you. Oh, well, thank you for coming and it's good to see you again. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for all, thanks to all for coming from my inconvenient time zones, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> I think we have the most convenient one here in Central Europe anyway. <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, just give me a minute, yes, sorry. Uh, if not, can I ask just a, well, this is not really a question, but uh, since uh, Professor Valakas, uh, I think mentioned that, and I will try to say that in my best Erasmian pronunciation, the Meg Au Frono, <laughs> uh, and he mentioned Professor Valakas mentioned that you know have, you know have some difficulties tra translating that in any language I guess. How would you or have you translated that or? Um, I don't yeah, know. it's that whole yeah that question of what sort of mega means um, uh, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have some, I don't have some great um, answer. I mean, um, thinking, yeah, I, I don't know. There is no really good direct um, translation of it. Thinking big, thinking, um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to, I think you would have to come up with something that was a little further away from the exact Greek to capture that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, and it's always that um, to convey yeah. Sort of, yeah. yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I, I'm glad you came back to that phrase because I think it's, um, 
and and I think um, the earlier question brought this up too. It's always like um, it's it's how you think of yourself. It's this um, personal estimation um, that is um, this sort of constant um, sort of motivating factor that's always in a kind of tension with what actually happens in the world um, that either ratifies or nullifies um, the way that you're thinking. Um, and so um, this is the this is a say the, a, a constant um, tension that these heroes are are operating with. Thank you. Thank you very much, just Sounds tantalizing enough. Yeah, <laughs> Professor Roberts. Yep. Uh, sorry. You're muted. Yeah. Could, could you please? Thinking about various strands that you've drawn out, and in, in part the particularly interesting one that talks about what what it is that Ajax has been as the Herkos the, the 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 form that his sort of second bestness has taken and his importance in that role and thinking about various things that go along with it, such as the, the sort of the great relief of the Achaeans when he's the one who's chosen to fight against Hector and, and what, what that stands for. Um, is it the case that this boasting seems to be, but the, the boasting seems to be one of those things that's strenuously differentiated in relation in the role it plays in relation to your enemy and in the place that it plays within your own group? This is it constantly a source of, of of trouble? So with within the within the group, but a source of I don't know, in, you know, emboldening or whatever between between the two groups. There's that very odd odd little story, one of Demodocus's songs in the Odyssey, where there's a quarrel that goes on. We're never told what the quarrel is about between, I think it's Odysseus and Achilles. And Aj Agamemnon is happy. And the one reading of that is that he's happy because he's had a prediction that um, the, the war will only end after the best of the Achaeans have quarreled. And amazingly enough, he doesn't realize that he might, since it seems so unlike him, might be one of those people. But uh, just that sort of dual functioning of, of um, the bow seems to be one of the things that's going on in both of these, these contexts. Um, that's, yeah, that's really a, that, just a sort of a side comment more than a question, I guess. Yeah, well, I think it, it gets at, um, you know, one of the um, central problems that Ajax is about, um, which is um, how do warrior communities um, maintain internal yeah. harmony when, um, they exist by encouraging people to become incredibly attached to personal honor and incredibly enraged when it's violated um, so that they become capable of fighting, you know, incredibly fiercely against external enemies. Um, so, I mean, you've just encapsulated that about, you've got to be very, very careful about what is said within the group and you can be very aggressive in what you say towards external enemies. Um, and um, the other thing I think that, um, you know, the Song of Demodocus brings up is um, how, how dangerous, again, to the functioning of one of these communities, um, the resolution of a conflict, of a competition is. Um, it, what keeps the um, community um, surviving and what keeps the war going and what keeps the poem going and all of that is that these things don't get decided. Um, and um, when it's decided one way or another, that's really a crisis. That's why the decision over the arms of Achilles um, is a huge mm -hmm. crisis. Um, you know, things were fine when mm -hmm. Ajax and Odysseus were both um, doing their thing. Um, but um, once it had to be decided which one of them would get the armor, then it really, really created a problem. And I don't think it's accidental that the resolution of a conflict between two of the Achaeans is also coordinated with um, the, the end of the war, because I think they kind of all go along um, in this kind of unresolved state. Um, but what it takes, um, it takes something really a kind of special effort, which often does sort of settle a competition 
to get the war to actually end. So from the point of view of the Iliad, that is the death of Hector. Um, and it's that Achilles kind of pulls out of the pack and um, fights in a way that is really extraordinary that um, allows this ongoing back and forth with, with the Trojans to come to an end. And, for the, and, and from the point of view of the Iliad, that is the crucial thing that makes the war um, the, the, that makes the war won, even though there are still things to happen. I think from the point of view of Demodocus's song, it's, um, it's the, the re resolution probably goes the other way. And it's that um, in fact, Odysseus is proven to be the one who um, has the crucial um, approach to taking Troy. Um, so it's when, it's when that's resolved, the question of whether what Achilles represents or what Odysseus represents right. is, the, is the crucial um, factor um, that Troy will be taken. Mm -hmm. So, um, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, let us thank uh, Bridget once again uh, for this very stimulating paper. Oh, thank you so much for coming and listening and for your Is great questions. Yes. Thank you so much. And, thank you very uh, much. I am very touched by your presentation for self-interest, oh. but still, <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since yeah. hearing about Ajax and uh, we, we, do, we do hope to, to meet in Athens soon. Oh, I do. I, I so look forward to that. Um, very much hope that that will happen. And in the meantime, I'm really, really grateful to you for including me um, in this series. And, um, and thanks yeah. to all for your participation um, and your comments. Uh, see you next time. We wait here.